actions to improve your mental fitness. This is Mental Fitness Matters. Hey, hey, everybody. Happy Thursday. You are listening to Mental Fitness Matters. I am your host, Tracy Austin, and this is WSIC Radio. I hope everyone out there is having a great week. We are quickly approaching the end of May, which many of you know is Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, But I'm hopeful that as we continue to push forward, that we continue to open up more conversations, that people are sharing their stories and getting the necessary support that they need to take care of their overall mental health and mental wellness. We want to remove the stigma and encourage people to seek support, to talk about it, and to begin to normalize our mental health just as important as our physical health. Um, And if you're tuning in to the show for the very first time today, you are listening to the Mental Fitness Matters show. It's a show designed to provide you with education, tips, strategies, and solutions to improve your mental health and mental fitness. Feel free to visit TracyAustin.com. That way, if you've missed previous episodes, you can go there and download uh, and subscribe to the Mental Fitness Matters podcast so that you never miss the show. Um, So May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and it's a time to raise awareness of those living with mental and behavioral health issues and to help reduce the stigma that so many people face on a daily basis. As I mentioned, mental health is just as important as physical health. And so just like there are strategies and solutions in place to meet your overall physical wellness goals, there are strategies and solutions that you can put in place to meet your overall mental wellness goals. And so encouraging people to talk about things and to share if you're not feeling okay, that's okay. Um, And I am super excited about my guest for today. Uh, She is a member of the town of Mooresville's Diversity and Inclusion Task Force located in North Carolina. And her group is highlighting suicide prevention for mental health and awareness month. And she wanted to share her story and her testimony in hopes of being a support to other people. I have Ms. Tip Jones with me. She is a metaphoric leader entrepreneur, cultural worker, and creative engine that engages innovative solutions of centering minority and women-owned businesses as a natural and integral part of organizations. A dance school, natural hair company, custom apparel line, online magazine, a nonprofit organization, and consulting firm. These are all businesses that Temp Jones successfully launched starting at the age of 13. She is a speaker, a workshop leader, and a panelist. Tip has overcome numerous suicide attempts during her youth, and she strives to use her personal and professional testimony to encourage women and let them know that they, too, can be overcomers. All of these things propel Tip to live out one of her passions, connecting women to share and create action plans for their personal and entrepreneurial success. Hello, Tip. Thank you for joining me. So, so nice to have you. Hey, Trace. How are you doing? (laughs) I'm good, girl. I'm good. Uh, We are so, so excited to have you on the show. And so thank you so much for being here and wanting to just share your story. And I think it's so important that as I just listed off all of the success that you've had, when I was talking to you one-on-one before we we hopped on today, there's been some other parts of your life that have led you kind of to where you are now. And so if we can, we're going to possibly make this a a two-part series. I want to be able to take our time with this, have this conversation, because not only for the importance of mental health awareness, but suicide prevention and awareness. There's so many things out here, people needing to have information, people to, needing to know what to look for. And so if you could just start to, by just just briefly kind of going through and, and sharing who you are with us and some of your story. Okay, no problem. And thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, who I am. Um, I am Ramona's daughter and Ethel's granddaughter. Um, I am from the Bronx, uh, and I am a a suicide attempt survivor, uh, which (laughs) we know all folks don't actually have that as their testimony. Some try and they actually succeed, unfortunately. Um, I am a wife. I am a very good friend. I am a major advocate for black woman entrepreneurship. I am a diversity professional. Um, I am someone who has struggled with my weight since God knows when. 
<laughs> um, I am a bonus mom because I got three kids in the marriage and didn't have to carry them, and they are <laughs> blessings to me. Um, I'm an only child of an only child uh, who has no living relatives. Um, I am an enigma, very unique, and I am incredibly self accepting at this stage of my life. Yeah. Uh, so that is my, those are my I am's. Yeah. Off the top of the dome. I love it. Uh, <laughs> I, love it. I will also say that I am, one of the areas that I seek to do better is in my refinement uh, because I don't feel that I am all that refined. <laughs> I, I am a professional, but I'm also an around the way girl. Yeah. Right. So I can speak to just about any group and feel comfortable. The question is whether they feel comfortable around me being my true authentic self, but it's just a question. Yeah. I'm not really worried. I love it. I love it. And I think that's so important when you're talking about being authentic and being able to be yourself around other people. A lot of times when we look at what's going on in the world of kind of mental health and self-esteem and self-confidence and knowing who we are, you know, that takes time. You know, that takes experience. That takes life. That takes hardship. That takes change and growth. Um, talk about some of those things for yourself as I hear you speaking of who you are now and just who you know that you're yourself to be, where did it all begin for you in a sense of coming into that knowing? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, I think it began when I was, I was essentially fighting for my life when I was pregnant with my first son. Uh, so this is post suicidal attempts, post major depression and things like that. It's many years later. Um, but I was, about 31, 32 years old, and I was having one of the worst pregnancies that the, the medical team, my medical team had seen in, in a long time. And I didn't feel the need to hide my story. Not that I was intentionally, do, intentionally doing so um, up until that point, but I don't feel that I, you know, I didn't wear it as a badge of honor. Um, I didn't share it willingly. I didn't express myself with the same level of confidence. But after having all that time to think, like being in the hospitals, um, like basically 90% of the nine months, um, whenever I was lucid, I said, man, when I, <laughs> when I have this baby, y'all getting all this work. Like you're getting everything. <laughs> on my mind, how I feel about life. Um, I am I am wasting no time to one embrace who I am, show my children that it's okay to be themselves, and also um, hoping to set some other women, specifically Black women, free from the need to hide behind any of these cloaks or titles or just whatever. And then I went through this experience where you know you had to kind of transition from embracing your full-on womanhood to your 100 percent of the time motherhood yeah. and i was having a real struggle with that there were so many things that i could not continue to do at the um at the speed at which i was accustomed because i now had a newborn and um i i had a friend during that time in my life who said, Tip, you're just going to have to embrace and mourn your womanhood and be okay with the transition that's happening and be verbal about it. Like, don't hide it. Don't act like you're super mom. Don't act like you love everything about this new lifestyle. And I swear I felt like she took the shackles off me. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely wasn't complaining about motherhood and I, I never would, but I, I was upset that I couldn't do the thing. I, you know, I couldn't just get grab my bag and, and jump in my car and roll out. And there was a car seat, a bottle and everything. And I was like, this is crazy. Where is the support group <laughs> for dealing with this transition? <laughs> and I became very verbal about the, the struggles I was having. And as I was, as I was being verbal, I was finding my voice and learning even that it wasn't complaining. I was just being expressive mm -hmm. too often if you're a black woman expressing anything other than happy happy joy joy of course your label is as the angry black woman 
um, if it's passion or God forbid you're having trouble being, being a parent, then they're like, Oh, children are a blessing. And you know, you're, you're, you're looked down <laughs> upon for, for having human feelings. Yeah. And I said, I said to hell with all that. I'm, I'm going to say how I feel about what's going on in life and give my permission, give myself permission to have those feelings. God gave them to me. So, <laughs> so was it during that time, that was at the first time you started kind of sharing some of the stuff that had been going on previously? You know, the majority of it, yes. I would say that's when I um, I put on the battery pack. Got I it. think I did it in part prior to that. Got it. Well, is it okay with you if we, if we go back there for just a second and not necessarily in too much detail, but I want to help people understand because I know when I was reading some of your bio, by the age of 13, there was a lot of different things you were doing already as a 13-year-old entrepreneur, right? And so the stress, the challenge, the all those things kind of coming along with that. Tell us about what was going on for you from a mental health perspective during that time and how did that transition over the course of your life uh, kind of to where you are now in terms of mental health yeah 13 and 16 i would say i was good um at 16 i went to college and i don't i think it was uh, some stuff going on between um my mother and i some changes that she might have been going through with you know dealing with like maybe maybe perimenopause and menopause and how she was um acting out and i didn't have an outlet I, you know, I had a friend, I had a boyfriend, but I didn't have an outlet for really sharing how this experience, me being my mother's only child and basically her sig her significant other, right? Because yeah. it's just us in the house. Um, I didn't know that I was stressed out. And then I went to college at 16. And I was increasingly more stressed out. Um, I don't even recall, Tracy, where I got the idea or where I was the first time that I took all my prescription pills. I have no recollection. I just know, I remember getting to the sixth time and being mad at God mm -hmm. that I was still here because I was so tired of having the nightmares. I was so tired of having the dreams um, of being more successful like I've been pressing fast forward for a long time, like always feeling like I'm late to life. Like I should have already accomplished this. I should have already done this. Like where was, what, what was the measuring stick? Where was I getting that from? And I can't recall, mm. but it, it plagued me. So the root of it, you know, if you don't, if, if you don't practice mindfulness, like being fully present in this life experience, stuff will get by you but it will sink into that subconsciousness and it will, it will begin to chip, chip away. And that's, that's essentially what I, what I contended with. I don't want to go too far before you ask your next question. So. Oh yeah, no, you're, you're it's perfect. I'm actually going to pause us right there. Cause I think that you, you said a couple of things in that um, always pressing go and pressing forward and feeling like you were late to life and hearing that, like you said, what was the measuring stick? And I think we see that in society so much now in the midst of this social media world and people posting and showing all of their successes and then people feeling like they're failing or they're not good enough or I'm, I'm doing something wrong, you know? So speak about that pressure because for you to have all of this at 13 through 16 and that you also identified the relationship between you and your mom, you were an adult pretty quickly in your household, you know, so that's another underlying pressure for somebody your age having to deal with that stress and then going off to college and dealing with that stress and things just adding up. What did it look like from an outsider's perspective? Did they see Tip as this hustler, as this entrepreneur, she's getting it done, there's nothing bothering her? What did people see looking at you versus what you felt on the inside or did they see what you exactly felt on the inside? So <clears throat> two people, two grown grown ups at the time, um, called me a quitter. Um, so what they saw was somebody who's who started things and did not finish them. Um 
at 16, I was going to, going to a college 12 hours away from home, and um, I had done 11th and 12th grade at the same time so I could expeditiously leave high school. And a math teacher said, I don't really, I don't give a damn how you got here, the fact that you're the youngest person on this campus. I'm going to make sure you fail. And I'm just like, like, what did I, <laughs> what happened there? Um, and she says, I know how you got here. And I'm thinking, yeah, doing 10 periods a day for 12 months, that's how I got here. Like, while everybody else was chilling in senior year, I was going to classes from 7 to 7. Um, but she she saw me as someone who didn't want to finish high school the way I was supposed to. And so she basically was, um, was going to make it difficult for me to finish college, of which I never did, by the way. Um, the next person, um, or second person I can recall, uh, who said, you know, you'll never finish anything was actually a therapist. Um, so by 20 years old, I was going to therapy because my grandmother had passed away suddenly. And I was just, my life was just rattled. Just, uh, it felt like the floor had just fallen from under me. Um, and she says, why, why do you start so many things? I said, cause I have multiple gifts. And my mother told, never told me I couldn't she always told me you could do whatever you're willing to work for she said well why don't you work towards one thing um like finishing school i said well technically i got what i needed from the school i run the most successful natural hair care business for my dorm room in this city right mm -hmm. and she says well our session is almost over and um I will say, you know, you can have the prescription. I'll go ahead and refer you out to this doctor or whatever, but um, just know that your biggest issue right now is that you won't finish anything. Maybe you should contend with the fact that you're a quitter. Oh. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. So the people on the outside, <laughs> they either saw me as a hustle, Tracy, uh, who was going to get it and was extremely successful and they had no idea that I was suffering or you had those two outliers. But no, no one was really, was keenly aware. Not even the people I was in a relationship with were keenly aware of what was going on on the inside. Got it. And so for you, as you kind of going through that journey, um, feeling the stress, feeling the pressure, I hear that you were already seeking help and support. You were already kind of receiving counseling and therapy, trying to get supports. Was there for you a moment um, where not only waking up in the hospital and trying to figure out why you were here, but was there ever a moment where you felt that call or need or knew there was something more? We got to be specific about the time, the timing in my life that you want me to answer this question from. However it flows for you, however you hear it. Can you ask, ask the question again then, Tracy? Yeah, I'm wondering, <laughs> like, as you're as you're kind of talking through um, some of your, your history and some of the things that you've experienced and some of the people that you've encountered and some of the emotions that you felt, the high stress, I hear the environment needing you and your mom there and you growing up really fast, you were successful as an entrepreneur, so you were always on go, go, go. You had a big loss, you know, grandma lost there. You were seeking mental health counseling and getting clinical supports, um, but there was still something going on where you were attempting to take your life. I'm wondering what was the switch or what was the pivot or what was the thing that um, allowed Tip to switch over and to cross over to the path that you're kind of on now? Oh, um, that, that, that's just God. Um, see, we went from age 16 to 24 of suicidal attempts, 28 exactly. Um, and I want to pause right there. There were some statistics that really kind of talk about uh, teen suicides and how a lot of times between that age group, they have it's up to 25 attempts before anybody even knows something's going on. And a lot of those attempts are some of them are a lot of them are successful, but there's a lot that are unsuccessful and about 25 attempts before. And for you to say 28. Yeah. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> let's see. 
the the switch for me was electroconvulsive therapy. Nobody wanted me to get it because that's shock therapy to the brain, right? They they've basically the psychiatrists um, force your brain to seize. They're not. They're not quite sure why it's so successful when it is administered, um, but since the you know the early 20th century, they've been using this technique for those who are severely depressed or have major um, major psychiatric issues. I was scheduled for 12 ECTs. I got six, and I guess they determined that I was doing all right. Um, one of the side effects of ECT is amnesia. I got to a place in that psychiatric hospital where I forgot why I was there. Like, I was just like, so <laughs> what happened? Like, I had no recollection of yesterday, the two days before that, the three days before that. Um, it's almost like um, they hit the reset button. After all those years, all that stress, all those medicines, um, and while going through that ECT process, I was at this psychiatric hospital. I think um, twenty-two or twenty-three days, and I had this this black male nurse. It is important to know that he is male, and also important to know that he is a black male. And I'll explain in, in a moment. Um, the psychiatric hospital. Um, at the time, you had your own room. You didn't. You didn't have a roommate. You didn't share it. And no nurse is to come into your room and close the door. It's just inappropriate, and it's a, it's like it's not legal, right? But I have been there so many days. This gentleman came in and closed the door behind him. Um, and he looked at me like he was like he was mad. Um, but it was almost like a like a big brother mad. I don't, I don't have any siblings, so I'm not sure how that goes, but it was like a big brother was mad at me. And he said, um, he said, you know, the medicines that you are on um, are enough for a 300 plus pound man who could be, who should be catatonic. And here you are reading a book. How is this even possible? What if you use that same level of um, mental strength and capacity that mental toughness and did something positive in the world. Do you know what, whose lives you could change? And he just goes on this rant. And I was just like, ah, ain't nobody trying to hear all that. Right? Like, I didn't want to hear that. Um, I want, he said, every time I come in here, every time I have a, um, a shift, I come, I ask you, what would you do if you got out today? And you give me the same answer. You go ahead and kill yourself every time. And then you go and you open up a book. I know what you're taking. I know what medicines that you're on. And you shouldn't even be awake, much less be able to read <laughs> or have a conversation. Yeah. It's like you're obviously overpowering these psychotropic medications. Use your energy for freaking good. And so then he leaves. And it was in that moment that it felt like um, when the, and I think I shared this with you on the phone before this, before we had this moment here together, he um when he closed the door and you know the little piece of the lock goes into the door frame mm -hmm. it was like something unlocked in me but i didn't want to give it too much energy i had actually become accustomed i had become accustomed to wanting to die and that became a goal and i don't steer i, I don't i don't steer away nor do i fear a goal so i'm like i have to achieve it because what did those people say to me just 8 years prior i'm a quitter I'm like, oh no, no. See, and I had to I had to reconcile this crazy thought that quitting on life, since I made it a promise to myself to quit on life, that I couldn't quit quitting on life until that man who who might as well have been um an angel from Absolutely. from heaven. Absolutely. Said those words and I and I got the ECT. Absolutely. Well, Tip, thank you for sharing that. And we're gonna continue this with uh, part two, because I think now as we go into the next part of this, and as you shared your story of some of that awareness piece, we're going to talk about prevention. And if there's anything that people could look for or do or next steps, we want to continue this conversation forward. So thank you so much for all your sharing so far. Um, how can people reach you, Tip? TipJones.com or OwnHers.com. 
I love it. We're going to be back with part two. I want my Mental Fitness Matters community to go out and shine bright like the stars that you are. We'll see y'all for the next part. Thank you for joining us today on Mental Fitness Matters. Tune in every Thursday at 8.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. for more tips, tools, strategies, and solutions that will help you reach your peak mental fitness. My name is Tracy Austin, and you've been listening to Mental Fitness Matters.